everybody. Comrade, you are uh, from Berlin originally, right? But you moved to San Francisco. Yes, uh, East Berlin. Oh, right, cool. And, um, oh, we've got some East Berliners? No? They've, no, they're uh, not brave enough to admit it. <laughs> it was there. Yeah, it was somewhere over there on the east. <laughs> it was there in the east. Yeah. Um, so, comrade, do you have any hobbies? I used to, I would say. I used to like photography, running, but about three years ago I, I moved to San Francisco and, you know, things. Oops. So you're just working now. <sighs> Can get a little bit busier. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I just want to say nothing about our work-life balance. Um, it's just too much fun stuff. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Okay, great. Well, we're very excited to hear about this talk. I'll be watching it um, from over there. Um, comrade, everybody! Thank you. I was told you're supposed to start a presentation with a story. So here it comes. Once upon a time, or more like around this time last year, I was investigating one of our Redis clusters. A node had a higher CPU utilization than the others. If you leave this unchecked, it might continue to climb to the point where the node fails entirely. To avoid this, I wanted to get a better understanding of what is happening. For this, you can use the Redis monitor command. It provides a log of key access in real time. It contains a timestamp, database, network address, but most importantly, the command and key. Ideally, the log looks like this. Different keys distributed across different nodes. On the other hand, if we see something like this, not so great. Too many keys with the same name are being accessed from the same node. This is called hotkeys. To find hotkeys, we could write a program which analyzes this lock and counts the number of unique keys. Something like this. We parse the flags, read the whole file into memory. Then we parse each line, split the columns by white space, and count each key using a map. Then finally, we convert the map to a slice in order to sort it, and then print out the most frequently used keys. If we run this, we get something like this here. Great, I mean, this is exactly what I wanted. So how come I never wrote a program like this? Because I just use this here. Unix pipes. And I think it's great because we just heard about this earlier, and I'm glad I get to reinforce some of the Unix philosophy. They combine programs that take an input, process it, and output it to the next. This only works because of the Unix toolbox philosophy. Don't add new features. Instead, write a new program, but make it compatible. This talk is about complexity, and here we have dealt with complexity head-on. You see, in software engineering, we're talking about essential complexity and accidental complexity. Essential complexity describes a problem at its core, something we cannot change. If we need to find the most frequently used keys, then that's what we have to do. But how you go about it creates something called accidental complexity. This can include writing overly difficult code, writing code which is slow. In other words, we're making our life harder than it has to be. Accidental complexity is something that can be reduced. If our implementation is slow, we can make it faster. 
we can write a program to solve an issue, or we can reuse existing tools. Go helps us in natural ways to reduce accidental complexity through its language, design, and its philosophy. Writing idiomatic Go code means to have code that has less accidental complexity. And I'm going to show you why this played such an important role for us at Reddit for the way we build recommendation pipelines. In my role as a software engineer, I work for the ranking platform team at Reddit. For those of you unfamiliar with Reddit, it can be described as a place where people come for the cats, but stay for the communities. Or in, in this case, dogs, or really anything you're into. With a lot of content posted every day, we need to figure out how to get this content to the users. This can be described as a machine learning problem, but it is also a software engineering problem, which is what I'm going to focus on. So what is a recommendation system? A recommendation system helps users to find content they find compelling. And this can be described in three steps. The first step is candidate generation. Candidates here is a fancy word but it simply refers to the content being ranked, for example, posts. There will be some candidates we want to remove. And finally, in the third step, scores are assigned to the candidates, which decides the final order of candidates before sending them to the user. So how does this translate into real life? On the right side, this is what we want to get. We want to create a feed for the user. We already have a data store that provides us with popular posts. We can fetch those posts. That's our candidate generation. And because we don't want to show the same posts over and over again, we want to filter some posts out. For instance, based on a data store that provides us with user post views. And finally, we want to sort the candidates by assigning scores. We could do this based on a heuristic like upvotes minus downvotes of a post, or we can do something more personalized and run it through a machine learning model. And there we go. That's all we need for now. You see, it doesn't stop here. With ranking systems, you want to iterate, add features, run experiments, see what works and what doesn't work. For example, if we decide there should be more video content, now we might have to worry about duplicates from these different post stores. So we also want to extend the filtering to remove those. Ranking systems are prone to experience a lot of changing requirements in a short period of time. Let's say you get to implement this in Go, and this is what you wrote. A service exposes a method called get popular feed. Here we fetch the post. This is great. You already moved this into a separate method. Here we filter the posts, run it through the model to assign scores, and then sort and return the results. When you first wrote this code, it didn't look like this. There were no helper methods. But as you were asked to add more functionality, you started to move code out. Why did you do this? You wanted the code to be maintainable. And by now, you should slowly start hating me that I say this, but maintainable code is code with less accidental complexity. So we can say continuous refactoring is our tool of choice to keep it in this state. This allows us to focus on the tasks that deal with the essential complexity. The problem is not everyone makes time for this. You get assigned to a different project, and 
someone else gets to pick up your work. They are asked to include image posts in the ranking pipeline. So let's make some space for them. The person has no idea what kind of code structure you had in mind. In fact, they are in a rush and they just want to get this out quickly. I don't blame them. They see the fetch post method here, but they don't want to modify it. They didn't write it. They just decide to drop the code right here. Rude. Why would you care about this? You can clean this up at any time, right? But maybe this won't be the last change before someone else shows up and follows the lead of the previous change. Can you imagine how the code will look like? It might not even fit on the slide anymore. Terrifying. It terrifies me in an environment like a ranking service where we know it's going to face constant changes under constantly changing requirements. And so at Reddit, we ask ourselves, is there maybe a way we can limit the number of times we have to refactor through a structural design? Let's think back to the Unix pipe example. Wasn't it wonderful how we could just combine these programs? And now let's look at this. This looks awfully similar to Unix pipe. So let's generalize it. Everything just becomes a stage, a step in the ranking algorithm. And this is how we can write it as a Go interface. A stage takes a request. And to match the Unix pipes analogy, it also returns a request again. This works because our request type has the request and the response. As the ranking progresses, candidates are added or removed in between. At Reddit, we developed this as a prototype for doing ranking, and we called it PipeDream. A ranking pipeline on PipeDream is an acyclic graph of stages. Let's translate the previous example to a graph of stages. Fetching those posts now happens in separate stages. Those stages perform network requests, which is a great excuse to use Go routines and execute them in parallel. Go has great concurrency features, but managing the lifecycle of a Go routine, still not easy. We can extract the implementation detail of executing the code correctly into a stage itself. We call stages that execute other stages meta stages. Stages of stages. If we want to execute stages in sequence, we wrap them in a series stage. If stages should be executed in parallel, we wrap them in a parallel stage. We take care of executing Go code concurrently and correctly so that the developer can focus on the business logic, which here are the details of the ranking algorithm itself. This way, a whole ranking pipeline can be pieced together, merging the candidates, filtering the posts, and so on. Oh, wow. Who colored this? That looks nice. But keep in mind, the semantic here is implicit. The interface or type system does not enforce this. It gives us the flexibility, but also requires us to act responsibly. OK, time to wake up. Let's check out how this would look like in Go. For example, fetch popular posts. A struct implements the stage interface. Dependencies are injected through the constructor. And here we fetch the posts and then add them to the request. A stage always operates on the request to make any changes. What about filtering? 
a previous stage has set up a map that contains the list of recently viewed posts. We can use this map to remove any candidates that have already been seen. A faster implementation would perform this in place. OK, what about matter stages? Meta stages are really the glue that holds the ranking pipeline together. For example, the series stage. The initial response is set to the first request. Then each individual stage is executed in sequence. And the most important part happens here. We set the input of the next stage to the result of the previous stage. More complex is the parallel stage. Lots of things going on here. Instead of using GoRoutines directly, we're using the Air Group package, which is a sync weight group, but it also handles error propagation and context cancellation for us. Each stage is called in its own Go routine. And here we pass a copy of the request to the stage. Why do you think we do this? Because each stage might modify the request, and so we copy it to avoid any type of race conditions or having to synchronize access in the first place. We block until all the routines have finished and then merge all responses back into one request. A meta stage doesn't always have to take many stages. We can also think of one that has exactly two stages. The if else stage. All of these stages together form a pipeline, and we define these pipelines in an expressive way directly in Go code. You can think of this as a domain specific language, but that's not the purpose here. The purpose is to make it easy to understand what is going on in any given ranking algorithm for anyone to look at it without having to dig through the code and understand the details. We're still talking about a service here, but the talk is titled From Service to Platform. And let's see, I have, I have 10 minutes left, so let's better get to it before they kick me off the stage. When does a service become a platform? I'm sure there are plenty of definitions out there. And because of that, here's mine. With a service, your customers are the users or product management. With a platform, however, your customers are other engineers. Engineers that use the platform to develop their own offerings, their own services. To be a platform means to think API first. And when I say API, I don't want you to think of something like this here. No, I don't mean your typical REST API. Nothing wrong with that. I'm talking about this here. If you create a package that exports types, it becomes part of your API. This defines the boundary of your API. This is part of your API. Those two are. This is not. How come we export types and variables so carelessly? Can you do me a favor? The next time you get to decide whether something should be exported or not, imagine you have to set up a HTTP REST endpoint, and you get to maintain it for, let's say, the next two years. Doesn't sound too great, does it? If in doubt, just start unexport it. For us, it's very clear what our API is. 
it is visible here. It is defined by what the stage package exports. As a small team, this is manageable. Our prototype service was built initially to rank the video live stream feed for Reddit. We added more pipelines, more product services, but we built and maintained them. Soon enough, we would start to onboard other product services outside of our team. And this is the moment that really marks the transition from service to platform. To scale this, you need to have engineers outside of your team build those pipelines as well. But we help and we guide. We have a base of existing stages, but each product comes with its own unique set of requirements. New stages are added, and as a platform, we need to make sure that new stages can also be used in other pipelines. Why? Because as we saw in the Unix pipes example, it only worked because there were a given set of principles how you should write a program. And so these are our principles. Let's illustrate this on an example. This stage fetches image posts. It also shuffles the candidates afterwards, which, by the way, is a great way to create feeds that always look slightly different. Let's start with the principle of clear naming, image posts. A stage should be named after the action it performs. So let's call it fetch image posts. The next one is limited scope. The shuffling that happens here doesn't have to happen here. A lot of other pipelines will need this, so let's kick it out and move the code into its own stage. It also helps to see more clearly what is going on in this single stage. Next, strive for reuse. We want to increase the chance that someone else is going to include a stage in their ranking pipeline. The key here that is used to look up the feature is something that we can turn into a parameter, making it configurable. And then finally, for decoupling, we might not even want to rely on this feature being available in the first place. Sometimes that means to make other APIs more flexible. Those guidelines exist to ensure contributions to the API maximize for reuse and clarity. These are two competing goals. If you over-optimize for reuse, you will sacrifice clarity, something that is very important to us in Go, to keep the code clear. I will show you how we deal with this. Rob Pike said it first, the bigger the interface, the weaker the abstraction. Put differently, the fewer methods an interface has, the more useful it becomes. Having every operation be represented by the same interface, by the same method, like it's the case here, gives us another benefit we can have a function implement the interface. A function type declares the same method as the interface, and the interface is implemented by referring to the function type. This is useful when one stage in the pipeline is too specific to be used for any other pipelines. So instead of creating a new stage, we can define it right here. Just put it there. It doesn't become part of the API. No commitment. This also works for middlewares. In our case, a middleware is a stage that wraps a stage. 
Middlewares provided us with great payoffs in this kind of ecosystem. And here are two examples. This is a monitor middleware to record the latency. Recording the latency of an endpoint, for example, in a microservice, that's fairly standard. But here we record the latency for each individual stage. What does that mean? For us, it meant that it made the profiler obsolete because we're able to see which part of the pipeline takes the longest right away using our observability tools. It helps us to figure out which part should we focus on first if we want to make things faster or more reliable. The next middleware helps us with incident management. A lot of our configuration can be changed without having to deploy using a dynamic configuration system. This can be utilized for stages too. Someone deployed a stage that starts to create issues in production later on. No problem, we can turn it off and it gets skipped. No custom code to add the feature flag and no rollback required. All of this is not to tell you how you should structure your ranking system if you happen to build one, or really any system. But I hope it's an inspiration for how we can make use of Go. We use this design to make sure we build small and reusable components from the start. It doesn't eliminate the need for refactoring, but it gives us the framework for refactoring. Middlewares have a great multiplier effect, which can make it for us a lot easier to run code in production. As long as it's just your team, it's not a platform. I'm sorry. A platform starts with the developers contributing code that do not have the same context that you have. And so providing an opinionated framework like this one will always create friction. This can be confusion, disagreement. And there are three ways to resolve this, but guess what? None of them are right or wrong. You can force your will onto other people and make them perform the changes like you intended. But you might risk being wrong. Sometimes it's needed when there's a learning curve, but maybe also that just means you need more documentation. No one likes a second one, but sometimes also needed when you have to ship code to production to ship a product. You might find the time to rethink the existing design but that's also not always feasible. All right, let's summarize. What did we learn? For sure, we have learned about essential and accidental complexity. Essential complexity is the actual problem we're trying to solve. Accidental complexity is just life, but we can improve it. A recommendation system consists of a variety of different ranking flows with the goal to generate content the users find compelling. And we used Unix pipes as an inspiration to build a framework, a system that helps us to create these small reusable components from the start, all driven by a powerful single method interface in Go. Lastly, if you have to choose between reusability and clarity, this is Go. Choose clarity. Those of you who think this is interesting, 
or maybe those of you who think this is insane, please come and say hi in one of the breaks. I, I would love to talk. And thank you so much for listening.